Cool, so today we're going to be talking about channels, uh, how to design APIs that use channels uh, specifically. So one of the, like, there are a lot of selling points of Go, and one of the main selling points of Go is the excellent baked-in support for concurrency. Right? This is one of the selling features is that lightweight uh, user mode threads, right, Go routines, and uh, channels as a concurrency primitive to implement uh, kind of CSP concurrency um, make doing things concurrently, handling uh, things in parallel really easy in Go. It's one of the selling points of the language. So given that, uh, you know, if you take a look at the standard library, um, it surprised me that when I looked at the standard library and looked at how many APIs use channels, it was only 10. And there are about 30,000 APIs. APIs is roughly like public functions uh, in the standard library. Um, for a visual representation of that, that's, that's about how many async APIs there are in the standard library. It's, uh, that 100% is rounded up. So what I mean by that is, you know, like, let's take, take a look at, uh, at IO Reader. IO Reader is like very, you know, uh, standard API. This is how you read from a stream, right? So my question is, like, this is, this is a synchronous API, right? I read, I ask, you know, a reader to read, and it will block until those bytes are available and then hand them back to me. So where is the async IO reader? Where is, where is this function in the standard library? And rather, like, why does it not exist? So that leads me to my first, this is, this is the first principle of designing APIs that use channels, which is don't do it. APIs should be synchronous. They should be blocking as much as possible. The reason that your API should be synchronous is because concurrency in Go is so easy. It's so easy that you don't need to make the async APIs. If you want to give someone an API, if you want them to be able to call it synchronously, the concurrency primitives are so good in Go that they can do it themselves. And by doing it themselves, it makes it easier for you, the author of the library. It makes it easier for you because you don't have to think about that, right? That's left to the caller. It's more flexible. Your caller can call your API synchronously, or they can call it asynchronously. Um, if you remember from KG's talk, he was uh, talking about his compile function that was originally like asynchronous, and then moved it to become a synchronous API. Um, and this is the reason. And said, like, well, if people want to do it asynchronously, they can. It reduces the surface area of your API, right? You don't have to. The standard library doesn't have to support both read and reader async or async reader. Um, if you take nothing away from this talk, this is the point you want to take away from this talk. In public APIs, as much as possible, you do not want to use channels. The rest of this talk is about the, the zeroth percent time that you do. Um, because when you do, there are some important things that you want to think about. Um, don't let that confuse you and think that you can, you can make APIs that are not thread safe. Your, your APIs still need to be able to handle being called concurrently. Okay? but you don't have to expose uh, APIs that, that um, are enforce uh, concurrency and async onto the caller. So what I mean by like turning a synchronous API into an asynchronous call is like, this is what it looks like. This is the complicated case. If you don't care about like the return values, you just put go in front of con.read, right? And you, you would have an asynchronous call. Um, Typically, you care about the return values, so you make a channel, and then you uh, start a Go routine in an anonymous function, and you send the results back through the channel. That's not that onerous, okay? So let's talk about, um, actually, I want to talk, we're, we're going to think about when you do want to make uh, APIs that use channels, right? So if that's, if that's true, if that principle is true, like, when do we want to do that? And I want to come back to that. We're going to go through like, some principles of how to design them with examples from the standard library. And with all of those examples, we'll come back and like, think about when we want to do that. So the first principle is 
if you're building an API um, that uses channels, it should declare the directionality of its channels. And what do I mean by that? Those, you see those channel operators? These are two APIs from the standard library. The after from, uh, this is time.after, um, which ticks, which sends a value on a channel um, after a certain amount of time has elapsed, and then notify to notify you of incoming signals from the operating system. The Go reference, or the Go spec actually says the optional channel, or arrow, sorry, arrow operator specifies the channel direction, send or receive. If no direction is given, the channel is bi-directional. So why do you want to include those things? And the reason is that it enforces compiler safety, okay? If you try to do, if you try to send on a receive-only channel, you will get an error, right? And more, and beyond that, beyond just having compiler enforcement, it also signals to, it's like a form of documentation. When you look at time.after, right, you can see it returns values from the channel. This is not an API that you would ever send something into, and so you can immediately see that. Um, so, like I was saying, this will not compile. If you try to do this, the compiler will fail you. Um, so, oh wow, that's cool. Um, that's like, it's a really good thing because it means that your API is not going to be misused. All right, let's talk about the second principle, which is that an API that sends an unbounded stream of values into a channel must document how it behaves for slow consumers. So what do I mean by that? This is new ticker from the standard library. This is the, the call that creates a ticker that returns values into a channel, sends values into a channel every a uh, certain every duration uh, period. And it says, it adjusts the intervals or drops ticks to make up for slow receivers. So if you're not reading those values off the channel fast enough, they're just going to disappear. Notify, this is for signals that are coming in from the operating system. Package signal will not block sending to C. This is essentially saying the same thing. If you do not service the signals fast enough, they will disappear, they will be dropped. This is open channel from the SSH library, and open SSH, and uh, not open SSH. The, the documentation for this says the Go channel must be serviced, right? So what it does is it opens a, a new channel, and then it returns to you like the requests that come over that channel. It says the Go channel must be serviced, or the connection will hang. Why, why does it have to do that? And the reason is that when you have an API that sends values into a channel, it's possible that when you try to send a value into the channel, the channel will be full. The caller will not have like, emptied the channel. It will be completely full. And at that point, every implementation has a choice. And the choice is it can either block when it sends to that channel, or it can not block. Right? So when I mean not block, I mean like you. this is what the select statement would look like. And it would basically, when you don't block, it means that you drop the value. The value will not be sent into the channel. It will disappear into ether. This is what signal, and this is what time.after, or signal notify, and this is what time.after are doing. Um, open, uh, the SSH library makes a different choice, right? It chooses to block. It says you have to service this channel. If you don't, the connection will hang. There is no language annotation for this. There is no enforcement around the compiler. It is your responsibility as the author of an API that sends values into a channel to document this, because if you do not document this, your caller does not understand how the API will work and is going to have to read the implementation, which is not what you want. So this is kind of like the, a similar, it's the same principle, uh, just under a different circumstance, which is that an API that sends a bounded set of values into a channel that it accepted as an argument has to document how it behaves for slow consumers. So the same thing, but it still happens even if you have a bounded set of things to send. This is from the RPC package in the standard library. This is the Go function, which uh, initiates an asynchronous call um, to a remote service. And you can pass it a done channel, which will receive a value when the call is done. Okay? But it's, it's, it's uh, accepting that as an argument. It only sends one value ever, which is when the call completes. Okay? But the channel could still be full. And the channel could still be full because it received it as an argument. The caller could have done anything with that channel. It could, have, it could be full by the time it receives it as, as an argument. And the Go function actually doesn't document what the behavior is in this case. So I read the source code. This is what the source code says. 
There's a comment in the source code, which is pretty great. It says, we don't want to block here. It is the caller's responsibility to make sure the channel has enough buffer space. And you can see this nice debug logging that uh, it basically makes the same guarantee as notify and time.after, which is that if the channel's full, your RPC reply is going to go into the ether, like you will not get notified of it. All right, so kind of the converse of these rules is that an API that sends a bounded set of values, okay, may do so safely without worrying about how fast uh, the receiver is receiving values, uh, whether the channel is full or not, by returning an appropriately buffered channel. This is the closed notifier interface from NetHttp. And it says it uh, returns a channel that receives a single value, okay? And so you can ask for the closed notify channel or it will return to you this uh, channel that gets signaled if gets a value if the client connection drops, okay? Before you're done servicing the HTTP request. Because the channel is returned, because the channel has that, uh, remember the directionality operator, the arrow operator? No one can send values into this channel except the implementation. And so what that means is because there's only one value that ever gets sent into it, if the library creates a channel that has space for one, it is always guaranteed to succeed. So it doesn't have to document that. Okay, it's guaranteed to never block. Okay, those were the easy ones because those are the ones that are almost always true. The other side of it, the things that aren't always true are the ones are like the rules where you have to make trade-offs, where it's not clear exactly what you should do. So that's act two. These are the trade-offs that you end up having to make when you're designing these sorts of APIs. So an API that sends an unbounded stream of values has to trade off between accepting the channel as an argument or returning a new channel. So this is the notify function from the standard library. Uh, the top one is the actual API in the standard library. And when I first saw this, this API, I said to myself, why, did, like, why doesn't it return the channel? I mean, I'm going to have to make the channel anyways, right? So it should just do that and then return it to me. That would be really great. I don't want to make the channel every time. And then I thought about it more. And I realized that if it did return that channel to me, it would have to make some decisions, some decisions that I might specifically how large is that channel? The depth, the, the buffering on that channel determines if signals will be dropped or not, right? So if I say, like, I can guarantee that I can handle, like, at most five signals in my loop, then I want a buffer of five. But if, the, if signal notify returned that channel to me, it would have to pick that value. And while it doesn't matter so much for signal notify, it also controls like how much memory is allocated for that channel or how much memory that channel could take up, right, if values didn't get serviced. And that might also be a thing I would like to guarantee. So if that's the case, you could think of another API, which was just, well, you pass, uh, it still returns the channel, but you pass the size into it. And the thing about that is that when you do that, you also force your caller into using a separate channel for every uh, call of that API. So to illustrate what I mean by that, um, by passing the channel in as an argument, it allows you to do this clever thing where you can do multiple calls to signal notify, but always pass in the same channel. So you can s handle signals from multiple calls with the same channel, with the same go routine, right? If, you, if it got returned to you, Every time you called this, you would have to spawn a no, another Go routine, right? Which is overhead on the scheduler, it's overhead in memory, not much, but in some cases it matters. But on the other hand, this is the SSH library again. This is the new client, uh, this is the call to create a new client connection. And you'll see it returns the channels to you. And I originally, uh, like I originally thought this was something that you shouldn't do. And uh, I had a conversation with the author of this library. Um, and coming out of it, I realized that I was wrong. That this is actually, it, there are actually cases where you do want to return the channels. This is the trade-off. And the trade-off is, what if I want to know when that stream of values is done, right? It's unbounded, but at some point it could end, right? So the SSH connection gets closed. How do I know that it gets closed? If I pass that channel as an argument, 
There's no way to know it gets closed. I would have to invent some sort of like terminal value, some tombstone to let you know like, oh, that channel got closed, but it would also have to notify you of like the ID of the channel so you could associate it. So when you're deciding whether to return them or take, take the channel as an argument, you have to consider like, do I want, do I need to be able to notify someone when it's closed? For signal, for notify, doesn't matter. Your program's always running. It always receives signals. There's no ending of it. Um, the other part of it is that it also gives you compiler enforcement that the caller is not going to muck around with your channel. So the API, you see that it has those, the arrow operator, the directionality. It means that the caller can't send values into here, um, which is another like important guarantee that like verifies that the person who's calling the code isn't using it uh, incorrectly. So we've seen all these examples. At the beginning, I said you want to try and avoid uh, writing APIs with channels. Um, so given that, given the APIs that we've seen, like when is it that you do want to use APIs that, that have channels in them? And that, you know, let's take a look at what um, all of the examples that we've looked at from the standard library um, and, and what they have in common, right? These are, these are some of the ones that we looked at today, like notifying you of when uh, there's like time.after and signal notify, the closed notifier, notify seems to come up a lot. Um, it's when a timer fires, when a client closes in HTTP connections. These are all asynchronous event notifications, right? This is when you have something that, uh, a signal that needs to be delivered to the program, something you need to notify the program of that happens asynchronously. Um, that is not part of like the, it, you don't expect it to happen immediately when the function returns, okay? That's usually something that you wanna look for and at that point you say, maybe this is like that 1% time when I do need to use a channel in my API. Some of you might be thinking, I know another API like that. What about when I serve for HTTP requests? HTTP requests are they're, they're events that happen asynchronously. My program needs to get notified of them and handle them. So the listen and serve function, that should return a channel, right? But it doesn't. It actually takes this handler. So you're thinking, callbacks in my Go code? It's more likely than you think. Um, any API that you write that returns or takes a channel as an argument, deals with channels, you could also write with a callback instead. And this is another trade-off that you have to make between whether you want your API to use a callback or whether you want it to use a channel. Let's go to the mirror universe for just a second where everything is almost the same, but people have goatees. You could imagine that the listen and serve function in the NetHTTP package, instead of taking a handler argument, instead return to you a channel that had the request and response objects on it, right? And you would handle those request and response uh, like objects as they came in. Or you could imagine the signal notify function instead taking a handler that gets invoked every time the operating system sends you a signal. When, why, why did we make this choice? Why does listen and serve take a callback instead of taking a channel? Why does notify return or take a channel instead of a callback? The important trade-offs that you wanna think about are, some of them are, one of them, like one of the dramatic ones is performance. A channel is a synchronization primitive, right? And so when it gets, when you're sending something through a channel, the program has to synchronize as part of the guarantee of the language. Um, and synchronization is, it can be slow. Another part of it is that callbacks can be wrapped, okay? So if there's some behavior, like you want to, well, there's this asynchronous event that happens, but when it's done, whenever the client has handled, has done whatever they wanted to do, I need to do some stuff afterwards. That might be a good use case for a callback because when a callback is finished, the control returns to your library and you can do something afterwards. Um, this is like important for the net HTTP package, right? Because it wraps things so that your program doesn't crash. If your handlers crash, it needs to do things like flush the, uh, the response writer when you're done handling. 
Um, another thing, an one of the reasons that I kind of like callbacks more for these is that you can turn anything that uses a callback into something that returns a channel, right? It's really easy to say like, oh, here's my callback function, and my callback function is take the argument and shove it into a channel. And then suddenly you have an API that does like is a channel-based one instead. Um, by picking a callback one, it's easy. It's again, it's the same kind of trade or uh, principle as the, the very first one of like, should you use, should you expose synchronous or asynchronous APIs? If you expose synchronous APIs, your caller can make them asynchronous. If you expose callback APIs, your caller can make them into channels. Um, the other one is that uh, composing channels is not nearly as, uh, let's say, uh, elegant as composing handlers, like an interface, the way that HTTP handler composes, so you can chain them together and nest them and call them one after another um, is, is very nice. Um, it's just, you know, a function call. On the other hand, channels are more idiomatic. Channels are, are how we think about um, dealing with asynchronous events in Go, right? And channel make uh, code flow easy to reason about. This is like, this is why we have Go routines and channels. Um, you know, this is why, you know, I, I had to throw the Node.js joke in there. Um, you know, this is, this is why we don't have, like, callback soup in Go is because we have these really nice primitives. And so trading them away is some, you know, it's, it's an important thing to think about from how, how your caller is going to have to deal with your API. So just to recap and go over the takeaways, um, always prefer synchronous APIs if possible. Declare the directionality of your channels. You should do this even if you're not making a public API, even if it's a private API, even if it's just a channel inside of your function, like declare the um, directionality of your channels. Um, document the behavior of your APIs in the presence of slow consumers. There is no way to know uh, what the API does if you don't document it. And then weigh the trade-offs. Weigh the trade-offs between taking a channel as an argument versus returning one, and then consider using callbacks um, instead of channels, or channels instead of callbacks, um, when you're trying to make an API that notifies callers of async events. Thank you. <laughs>